to today's great webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to see so many of you on today. Today we're going to talk about opportunities for continuums of care, grant and per diem programs, and VA to really partner more integratedly with this new NOFA that just came out recently. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to just go over some logistics and also introduce myself. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I'm Catherine Monet with National Alliance to End Homelessness. Today for our speakers, we have Cindy Najendra, the director of our Capacity Building Center, Bailey Crone, the executive director of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, and Jeff Quarles, the director of VA's Grant and Per Diem Program. I'm just going to go over quickly a few logistics. Everybody on the lines are on mute. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so if you know questions pop up, please feel free to pose them in the questions box that should be on the right hand of your screen. The webinar and slides will all be posted following the presentation at nhomelessness.org. Um, so, oh, I have a slide on that. So here, next slide. Some important things to know about today's, no, well, today's webinar, or I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but for today's webinar, we're going to go over a few things, like important things to know about the GPD NOFA, um, how COCs and GPD programs can coordinate as a system, and really how to determine how many and what types of beds each community needs. Next slide. So this is a really great opportunity for communities, right? And I think we're going to talk a little bit more today about why this NOFA is so important. One of the things that is really critical for communities to end veteran homelessness is that they're working collaboratively and that everybody is at the table really, you know, heading in the same direction and trying to do everything it can to maximize resources and end veteran homelessness. So we're really going to try and hone in on the different types of collaboration that is required in order to get there. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to just touch a little bit on why this NOFA is so important for COCs because I think this is something that hasn't always been apparent, right? So really this is the first time in the program's history that grantees will have to reapply for funding as opposed to just being renewed and I think Jeff maybe can touch a little bit more on that during his talk. This is also something where you know, we're looking at this NOVA and it really reflects the way that the program has transformed to better reflect the needs and resources of communities that are trying to actively work towards ending veteran homelessness. Um, in the past when these programs had applied for their grants, in some instances they were literally the only resource that communities had, but as new programs have popped up and things have changed, you know, the demographics of homeless veterans have changed some and quite frankly so have their needs. So this is an interesting opportunity for communities to really look at refocusing their mix of resources and really utilizing the resources and programs that they have to serve as many homeless veterans as possible. Um, for COCs in particular, one really important thing to note is that this application really will require some pretty intensive conversations and planning and coordination across both the COC and GPD well, the COC system, I guess, and GBD providers, right? So folks really need to work together to review their data, think about the needs in their community, understand how their resources can meet those needs so that, you know, you can serve as many, if not all, the homeless veterans that you have in your community. So I'm actually going to turn this over now to Bailey Crone, who's going to talk about specific things that you should know about this NOFA. Hi, great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so before I get started here, just wanted to make a, a quick note. Um, so while the NOFA itself is new, and this is a big change for a lot of providers, uh, it's going to be a catalyst for massive change across the country. The process is one that was expected, so I did want to give some kudos to the VA and to the GPD um, office for the rollout of this whole process. We've been working with GPD programs for a long time. Um, and while this will be a catalyst for change, the coming NOFA um, and you know the, the process of change itself has been taking a lot of provider input in, into account in the development of the models. Um, a lot of folks, especially if, if we've got 
people on the line from from the COC. I know the um, the changes in HUD transitional housing through the COC process felt a little tumultuous, and I think this has been handled um, uh, handled very well. So. While there's a lot of change happening, um, I think a lot of programs have been planning for big changes to GPD, and uh, the GPDs in your community are, are likely already working through and have been working through a lot of these ideas, even if they weren't using you know, the terms and the, the structures outlined in the NOFA. Second piece I want to make sure you're aware of, and I'm sure Jeff will talk about it as well, is that there are some really great resources on the GPD website. So as you go through trying to learn more about this NOFA and about what the change means, um, be sure to check out those resources, a lot of great stuff there. Two essential pieces that you'll find <clears throat> that you might hear talked about uh, from the GPDs in your community. One would be the notice of, of termination. So existing per diem grants, uh, as noted in the first bullet point here, they're set to expire as of the end of this fiscal year, September 30th. That means that all current GPD providers and service centers have to submit new applications. So there's two pieces that are essential when looking at uh, the GPD website and, and knowing how this whole process is going to run. One is the notice of termination. The other one is the notice of funding availability, a NOFA. We'll probably refer to it as a NOFA from here on out. It's also important to note that only current GPD programs can respond to this NOFA. We're going to get to that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And as with any federal grant, if anyone here has applied for federal grants, no funding is guaranteed until you get that award and you're operating. So um, for GPD programs that are reapplying, you know, it's not, it's not a shoe in They need to submit a strong compliant application um, in order to be considered for funding. Can we go to the next slide, please? Jeff is going to talk in more detail about the specific models, but what I'd like to note for you here is there are essentially five models allowed plus the service centers. As noted in the slide above, TIP and special needs grantees are not responding to this NOFA. It's the rest of your GPD programs. So for the COC folks that are on the line, this is a really good time to talk with the GPDs in your community about the needs you're seeing and how GPD with these new models can potentially play an even stronger role in your community system. For example, maybe they could change and serve as a bridge to housing or maybe your community is seeing a high need for veterans who are leaving medical facilities to have uh, an avenue to permanent housing after they leave that facility. These are really good opportunities to discuss the models in some detail based on what you're seeing from your side, community need for, um, for veterans in your, in your area. And again, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the models, so I won't, um, I won't talk too much about them here. What we will note is that GPDs right now are having to submit a separate application for each model. And so while you're probably going to see either the same amount or fewer GPD beds in your community, know that whereas previously you might have had one GPD grantee in your community, you might have uh, four or five um, GPDs grants in your community equaling the same number of bed. It's a long way to say they're probably working on several applications right now, so you know don't feel insulted if you reach out to your GPDs to talk about how excited you are to plan around these models and they take a little bit of time to get back to you because they're there's a lot going on right now for folks that have worked on the COC NOFA, and you, you know that time period. Can we go to the next slide, please? So what else should you know? Well, for one, this NOFA applies to VA medical centers, so there's not direct overlap to the COC map. It's good for you to know because that means while each medical center is looking to fund and prioritize funding for the four models listed here, bridge housing, low demand, clinical treatment, and then hospital to housing, there's not a direct overlap with your, with your COC. That means that in any given COC, you might end up with, for example, two highly rated priority model bridge housing programs um, if you've got two VA medical centers serving, serving your COC. You might end up with more, you might end up with fewer, but it's important to know that it, there's not going to be direct overlap with uh, the COC map and the VA Medical Center map. You might end up with more um, grants coming into your community, but you're still going to have, as I mentioned before, either the same number or fewer overall beds from the GPD program. Next slide, please. 
So the GPD program has always had two core goals, right? So paraphrase to the goals are to help veterans achieve permanent housing and to help them maximize their income as a conduit to housing stability, right? This has been a, these have been core components of the GPD program since its inception. GPD in any of its forms can serve as a functional component of a housing first system when the communication is open between the partners and the barriers begin to lower for veterans. I think we all notice that this NOFA is definitely a step forward towards that community coordination. And it really is, as, as Catherine mentioned before, an opportunity to support your local GPDs as they dig into their local data to decide on what is the best fit model. Um, do they want to be applying for multiple models? You might have GPD programs that submitted their initial application 20-something years ago. And at that time, as Catherine noted, there really wasn't too much else out there, and so they might have built a program around a SIS, a Service Intensive Transitional Housing Model, and maybe now they're looking at ways to build in some different kinds of services. They can utilize the data that you have from the work you're doing on, in the COC to help build out a better idea of what the community needs overall as opposed to just what that individual program needs. So it's a step in the right direction. We're seeing some communities where the GPD programs themselves are convening as a community to try to help determine within that medical center catchment area uh, what's needed and who should apply for, for which model to maximize the services veterans are getting. Uh, this is a great way for the COC to potentially come in and, and provide some additional data to help, to help them plan. Next slide, please. Let's talk about lowering barriers and about the NOFA and how you can help your GPDs submit the best applications so they're part of your system um, and serving the best function in your community. From our perspective, this NOFA is a pretty clear call to action for GPDs to lower barriers. So 25 years ago when, you know, when GPD was new, when the first uh, applications were submitted and programs were funded, they weren't necessarily functioning within a housing first modality because that wasn't the narrative that we use to talk about services for homeless veterans then. There wasn't very much available, as I noted before. So many of these agencies were trying to do all things for veterans um, within their one program. And so their previous narrative probably is going to reflect that kind of consideration, trying to do everything within one program for homeless veterans in their community. Now, as they're rewriting these applications, it's going to cause a fundamental shift in how they look at their own program and um, how, how their program services are structured. They might have built a model around, um, you know, if veterans come in, you must have a clean and sober environment. Um, if a veteran relapses or continues to use after moving into their program, maybe they had immediate discharge from that. Um, and, and so this is, a big, this is a big shift. It's hard. Change is challenging. If you take nothing else away, know that from the GPDs we've been working with for a long period of time, we know that making this kind of change is really, really difficult. Um, but they're trying to do what's in the best interest of the veterans that are in their community, just like you are within your COC and in the programs that, um, that you have that are serving veterans. Uh, next slide, please. I think when we get to talking about um, the benchmarks a little bit later on today's call and when we get to your questions, uh, it's important to keep in mind that you know this is this is a step forward. This NOFA is a step forward in the right direction and motivating GPD programs to be connected into their community. And we think it goes the other way as well. It should motivate the COC, uh, SSVF grantees, to recognize the value played by GPD programs and this opportunity to help them kind of reset and reframe some of the services that they offer so they can be part of this seamless housing first system in every community. Now I'm going to stop on that for here to turn it over to Jeff so he could talk a little bit more about the models. Thanks, Bailey. Uh, I appreciate being invited to the call today and thanks everyone for, for joining us. Uh, Bailey mentioned a, a couple of, of things that I, I wanted to uh, reinforce uh, that, uh, you know, this is a big change for, for programs. It was mentioned a little earlier that it, it impacts uh, the vast majority of our programs. About 97% of the transitional housing beds that we have 
uh, do not basically have an end date or didn't have an end date. Basically, they received their funding as long as the funding was available. Uh, they followed our regulations and, and passed annual inspection. And therefore, we have our original um, grants that go back to uh, 1994. And as, as was noted a little bit earlier, a lot has changed since 1994. So as we've worked over the past couple of years uh, to figure out how we can do this uh, transformation and having uh, folks reapply for the program, we wanted to make sure that the uh, award was time limited and that we wanted to make sure that as the program that there has some real clear roles as to what the program is doing within the community. Uh, we took some time um, uh, over the last uh, about year or so uh, really uh, uh, developing certain models that we've been practicing, uh, trying out, and then redefining some things. And as we have stated a little bit earlier, that there are these five uh, models plus um, the service centers that organizations will need to declare for. Um, the goal here is to help organizations and communities define specifically what they're doing and a purpose that they're serving in their specific community. That's really important to understand. Uh, we're going to go through a few slides to talk about these models, but I would encourage you uh, to go to our website, uh, www.da.gov slash homeless slash gpd.asp, and there's a section there that mentions our uh, 2017 notice and, and other documents. And we actually have some uh, recorded presentations that go into the different models that were done, as well as a really broad, detailed overview of the um, NOFA, if you're interested in that, and actually a couple, and one uh, recorded uh, question and answer session that goes on for an hour and a half. If you want to put that on in the background when you're working one day, just to kind of listen to the types of questions that have come up and that you may have some interest in. Um, so the first model that I wanted to mention uh, is Bridge Housing, and you've probably heard us talk about this. Uh, organizations have been been doing this for a while, although in the last, uh, it's been almost a year where uh, we came out and uh, defined, specifically defined, uh, bridge uh, housing and basically looking at um, a veteran who's been offered and accepted a permanent housing intervention uh, like um, HUD-BASH or SSVF or uh, Shelter Plus Care, uh, but they're not able to immediately enter their permanent housing because it's not immediately available. Very simple concept. Uh, you and I today, if we went out and you know try to get an apartment, we might be able to find a lease today. Uh, but we'd have a lot of things to get through before we could, you know, get this all said and done. And so this recognizes the, the need for that and the program's availability to uh, be involved with a housing first or rapid rehousing approach with veterans, uh, bring them into a, a program with a permanent housing focus right off the bat uh, with, a, with a short stay, which we're anticipating that it's 90 days or less. Uh, we recognize that it's it's going to be individualized, but we're anticipating that it would be 90 days or less. And this um, permanent housing offer uh, and acceptance uh, is not just like a referral. It's not a referral to one of these programs. It's basically like someone's been en enrolled and accepted for HUD-BASH case management. And we're, you know, anticipating, the, you know, the housing is coming with that because they've been uh, accepted for this, for this, uh, uh, this case management, they're eligible for the program. And they're going to get permanent housing. The plan from day one is permanent housing. Uh, one of the things that's unique about this particular notice for us is we've defined what some of the outcomes that we're expecting will be. And in, in particular for this particular model, uh, we're looking that 70% uh, of the folks uh, exit to permanent housing and come into the program, and that there are 23% or less a negative discharge. We want people to keep folks engaged in the programs. We don't want people being kicked out of the programs and or veterans just vanishing from programs. So we really want to keep folks engaged. So British housing, short stay. Now one of the things that's a little bit different uh, about 
uh, this now since we're declaring these models. You guys know that we've been talking about bridge housing for a while now. Uh, in the past, if you had an existing GPD program, because you had an existing grant, we allowed folks to identify these particular models and say that we would like to do bridge housing uh, and to kind of stay within the bounds. We allowed you know, an organization to go up to like 50% of their existing bed uh, to do bridge housing. Well, as they're reapplying, and basically these are new awards, organizations say, well, I'd like to do all bridge housing, or I've got you know, what used to be two awards, combining them as, as, as one award under a medical center, and half of it I'm going to do bridge housing, and half of it I'm going to do service intensive transitional housing. So that's one of the things that's unique about the models, and as you're having these discussions, you'll kind of think about a portfolio of services that you'll need in your community. Uh, next slide. Okay, the low demand model. Over the past about two years, uh, we have been working with uh, the University of South Florida and uh, the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans, VA's National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans, to uh, work with communities and GPD programs to use their existing GPD GPD programs to really lower barriers and use kind of a harm reduction approach, like what is used in a safe haven, to engage uh, veterans who are, let's say, chronically homeless, uh, who suffer from mental health and substance use disorders, who haven't made a commitment to recovery, who have, maybe haven't been involved in treatment, maybe they bounced in and out of these residential programs year after year. And they're really, they've been very difficult to in, engage traditionally in these particular programs. We're looking at these particular models to focus in on safety for these uh, veterans, to not have pretreatment requirements, to take a low demand approach, be willing to work with and retain veterans who, um, you know, return to drinking or usage. Doesn't allow drinking or using in the facility. Um, that doesn't happen in our current safe havens that we have in, in Grant Per Diem, but it does allow for safe spaces and encouraging keeping veterans engaged while we work with them toward permanent housing. One of the most common questions that we get about the low demand is, um, you know, what definition are we using for chronically homeless? We're not, we're not uh, uh, saying that the person must absolutely be chronically homeless to exclude them. We're saying typically they will be chronically homeless, but we're looking at someone who is very difficult to serve, who is unable or unwilling to stop drinking or using, uh, who is a, a street homeless person who's out there and is difficult to engage. This, this is a program that you're wanting to create a safe environment for folks uh, to, uh, to work with this particular model. And with this model and uh, the hospital housing model, we'll actually be doing some uh, technical assistance uh, for organizations once they begin uh, to implement these models. There's a great presentation that's on our website. Uh, about this uh, with uh, Roger Casey and uh, Scott Young and Paul Smith uh, uh, to talk about low demand. So I would encourage you to, to check that out. It's, a, it's about an hour presentation. Uh, next slide. The hospital to housing um, model uh, or respite care. Uh, this is really targeting veterans who uh, have been engaged in the hospital and basically uh, they don't have a they don't have a place to go because they're homeless and they need some recuperative follow-up care. So it's partnering the local VA medical center um, with the grant and per diem program, and the VA is committing, uh, let's say, one of the homeless primary care teams to uh, uh, provide recuperative care to veterans while they are in this transitional housing uh, program. Um, these are folks you know can handle their activities of daily living. We're not talking about uh, like a nursing home care facility, a skilled nursing center. We're talking about people who need some follow-up care that can handle their daily living, that the VA is going to provide medical care, and they're committed to doing that. Uh, lots of, lots of um, uh, folks out there that need that kind of service. Uh, I believe this past year we had about nine uh, medical centers that were involved in uh, providing this type of a model either in a grant for DM program or domiciliary care. So we're excited uh, for the opportunity to do that. Great opportunity for, um, for discussion and collaboration for sure. 
uh, and the, uh, the you know the targets here are 65% uh, uh, exit to permanent housing, and again less than 23% for negative discharges. Next slide. Well, we recognize that there are those programs that we have in those communities who are looking for uh, some residential-based treatment services for uh, homeless veterans uh, readily at, can access where they're providing uh, specific treatment for a, a mental health or substance use diagnosis, kind of clinical-driven services that have these um, uh, transitional housing components available that continue to help a veteran uh, achieve permanent housing as well as increases in, in skill or income. Um, so we're looking for uh, uh, veterans who are being involved in these particular programs are veterans who are you know, actively choosing to go into these kinds of programs. Uh, you know, we recognize that some veterans are just looking for this. And for those veterans who are making that particular choice, that they have these types of programs. They typically you know, have you know, clinical staff that are uh, credentialed to do this kind of work, credentialed or licensed to do this kind of work. Uh, and in this particular case, um, they're going to provide both um, uh, treatment services through things like individual and group therapy, maybe family work, um, psychoeducational uh, work uh, with veterans around uh, recovery types of issues, but at the same time also have components in them to assist persons in, to get into permanent housing. Uh, the targets here focus in, again, on exit to permanent housing, about 65%. And uh, uh, exit to uh, employment around 50 percent, and then you know, the negative discharges at 23 percent or less. Next slide. So the the first a few models that we mentioned uh, were the ones that were <coughs> uh, prioritized in in the first priority, and then um, the the last model, the service intensive transitional housing. You can think about this as a kind of a general purpose transitional housing. It may focus in on some employment issues. Um, it's viewed as a little bit more traditional. Uh, the scope and services, uh, you know, really focus in on you know how you, you can help a person get housed, uh, get employment and or income, have community supports, connecting with the community. So that's that's the five basic models. I would keep in mind that organizations can have a mix of these particular models. One of the ways for you to um, to think about this is to think about each of these models playing a specific role within your community, which is important for you to discuss as you're going forward. Again, we do have some um, some information, a little bit more in-depth presentations about these models. Um, there's also some some detail that goes into uh, these descriptions as well, right in our notice of funding availability, because we laid out for the applicants, specifically what the models are, what the targets are, and kind of what is expected. And I guess I'll pause there. Thanks, Jeff. I uh, really appreciate your covering those models. We have a lot of questions for you, so I will uh, save those till the end. Uh, my name is Cynthia, and I will be talking about um, recommendations for COCs that we want to really highlight in this NOFA. So, COCs should know what the GPD NOFA is asking for several important reasons, some of which we've touched on, and we'll kind of go now go over now those reasons, and what types of activities GPD programs and COCs and other relevant stakeholders are really encouraged to engage in together through this NOFA. So even though COCs don't directly control this funding, the COCs are important as the system planners, the data holders, operators of coordinated entry often, and the close coordination of COCs with GPD programs is really critical to achieving an effective end to veteran homelessness, as well as to improving the COCs system performance outcomes, which we will touch on a little bit. In this GPD NOFA, the VA is encouraging COCs to take a role in making planning decisions about GPD's inventory and involvement in the community's overall crisis response system. Um, so knowing about what types of beds, how many beds um, your system needs is going to be a, a crucial discussion to have. And one of the goals of this webinar is very much to inform COCs of what's in this NOFA to, and, and to encourage COCs to play a strong role in coordinating around the application as well as the activities needed to have a healthy and well-coordinated system. 
So in the application, GPD providers are actually asked to get letters of support from their COC. And the, the VA expects the letters from COCs to show true collaboration and coordination that's happening between GPD providers, the COC, and other stakeholders. Um, and so in these letters, uh, COCs shouldn't just write a generic letter of support. Rather, COC should be really thoughtful and very specific and provide details about things like what the community needs, how the GPD provider and the COC are coordinating, how the GPD provider uh, is involved in planning around ending veteran homelessness, and whether the GPD provider is entering data into HMIS, um, and you know, providing things like real-time data to the master list or our comparable data sharing system. And, and provide evidence that there has been close cooperation in developing the applications and determining bed demand together. Uh, one thing to note is that the letter counts towards uh, a 50-page limit that the application has, so you want to keep that in mind as well. VA reviewers will focus on how the project plan addresses the areas of outreach, project plan, ability, need, and coordination in relation to your selected model or models, and I'm sure Jeff can um, answer some questions about that as well. The VA expects applicants awarded will meet the VA performance metrics for the selected model that we mentioned earlier, and, and as Jeff said, that there's a lot more on their website about what those performance metrics are. Some examples of expectations of GPD programs to coordinate with COCs that can be and probably should be described in the COC letter of support are uh, GPD's participation in coordinated entry um, and how you know how that how that works is GPD taking referrals from coordinated entry are they part of the planning uh, the update of master list or comparable data um, using GPT on a timely basis how how is GPD involved in that um, and how is the COC sort of integrating their data GPD's participation in case conferencing with other programs that's something that happens in a lot of communities um, that are uh, making a lot of strides in decreasing veteran homelessness. GPD's commitment to housing first, especially exiting veterans to permanent housing as rapidly as possible, and GPD's agreement to implement communities pro the community's process for making the offer of permanent housing and how the community has decided that you're going to start documenting that, um, especially uh, when trying to achieve the federal benchmarks and criteria, which we will also talk about. If this level of coordination is not happening in your community, this is really an excellent time. Uh, to, it's a great opportunity to have those critical conversations and make plans around these activities with GPD providers and the COC. And this is really why the GPD uh, no friends were such a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity for greater collaboration that will help improve efforts to end veteran homelessness. And it, it's also important to note that the communities that have effectively ended veteran homelessness or very close really engage in most or all of these activities. So it really does help uh, to make a system much more successful. In addition to providing a letter of support that gives the opportunity for stronger collaboration and coordination between GPD providers and the COC, there are also two very important reasons COCs should be involved in these planning conversations. HUD has put a great deal of emphasis, as I'm sure every COC <laughs> knows that's on the phone, on the COC system performance measures, which COCs have to report in the NOFA now, in their NOFA, in the COC NOFA. GPT bed inventory impacts HUD system performance measures as well as the ability to achieve the federal benchmarks and criteria, especially the updated ones, which we'll talk about, to effectively end veteran homelessness. Um, and so, you know, GPD programs and the COC are, you know, all kind of gears in, in a system together. So what, you know, uh, type of bed you have, how much of an inventory you have, um, really does affect the overall system. Inventory can really drive outcomes, and the number of GPD beds and how long people stay in GPD impact system performance measures, such as the average length of homelessness in the community. Since people in transitional housing are still considered homeless, the length of time someone may spend in a service-intensive transitional housing bed, for example, will impact the overall average length of time homeless across the whole system. So having something like too many service-intensive transitional housing beds where people stay for longer periods of time, instead of uh, having bridge beds, for example, could lengthen the COC's average length of homelessness. And right now, no other part of the COC in the system is really trying to maintain transitional housing at current levels. And HUD has strongly encouraged COCs to reallocate transitional housing to permanent housing programs if there are too many transitional housing beds in the community that are needed. So need is really important to determine. And so CSC should be involved in planning how many and what type of GPD beds they have in their community's inventory, 
and they will really ultimately affect their competitiveness in the COC NOFA as well as their system performance measures. COCs should really work with GP2 providers and use a data-driven approach to do this kind of demand analysis to figure out how many GPD beds the system needs and really what type of beds the system needs. And now you know we've just described these five models, uh, and so figuring out what models are needed is really key. The CUCs uh, should also look at the outcome expectations we mentioned earlier. Uh, this NOFA sets out out outcome expectations by model that the providers will have to hit. So the conversation about whether they will be able to hit those outcome expectations for the model they choose to apply for will really help to guide which models they do apply for. So communities are, you know, to do this demand analysis and figure out what your, what your system needs, communities are uh, encouraged to forecast the inventory that might be needed across bridge beds and service and traditional housing in whatever may, ways kind of make the most sense for the data information that your community has available. And you definitely want this to be data driven as much as possible. So to better understand the need for beds, uh, COCs can use uh, the master list, HMIS, or other comparable real-time data, something that's sort of telling you, um, you know, how many veterans are becoming homeless each month, um, you know, where they're exiting to, uh, whether they need, how many people need bridge beds, how many are accepting a housing offer but need a place to stay and need bridge housing, if that is something your community is documenting, and if it isn't, you should probably start doing that. How many are declining permanent housing offers and are choosing service-intensive traditional housing? Um, because that will be an important determination to see what really what veterans need and what what they're what they're asking for. Um, for the other three housing models, um, you know the the that that were discussed, uh, the COC and the GPD and other stakeholders in the medical center will have to kind of discuss what the system needs. So um, some additional considerations for COCs that um, are important, uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I do encourage you to go and look at the update that is from February 2017, so just from this month, USICH and the federal partners have updated the federal criteria and benchmarks for achieving the goal of ending veteran homelessness, and that is on the USICH's um, website and the address is there, so please check out the update, but we will just quickly kind of go over a few things that um, are important for COCs to know and how um, the, the GPD sort of bed inventory and type really impacts your uh, ability to achieve those, the criteria and benchmarks. So I want to point out the significant changes that impact GPD programs and their role in the system in terms of achieving these criteria and benchmarks, and there are changes to criteria three uh, that are really important to po point out, um, and that's the use of service-intensive traditional housing in limited instances, um, and we'll also talk about benchmark D uh, in a moment. Um, so previous versions of, um, previous versions here, I'm sorry about that, uh, there are uh, changes to criteria three, again, because previous versions um, said that the number of veterans experiencing homelessness who enter service-intensive traditional housing is significantly less than the number of veterans entering homelessness. The previous version required veterans entering service-intensive traditional housing uh, to be less than the number of veterans becoming homelessness, but that only required really a difference of maybe one less veteran. So now federal partners will have discretion in determining benchmark success based on broader system data and localized conditions. So you want to have a really a, a significant number um, of people um, who, uh, you know, that are entering um, non-service intensive traditional housing, and uh, federal partners kind of have wider discretion on that. Also, benchmark A now includes chronic and long-term homelessness. So what does that mean? Um, this is a big change, the new definition for long-term homelessness, and this will impact your ability to reach benchmark A. There's a new specification that only those chronic or long-term homeless veterans who choose service-intensive transitional housing to address an identified clinical need are exempt from benchmark A. So the veteran does not have, so long-term homelessness has the definition of veterans who meet the length of homelessness requirement to qualify as chronically, homelessness, as chronically homeless, but the veteran does not have a qualifying disability. The calculation of 12 months of homelessness includes time spent in transitional housing. That's very important. This means veterans can become long-term homeless 
homeless while in GPD or traditional housing. So that's very important to note um, because that will definitely impact your ability to reach that uh, benchmark A. Communities now must end chronic homelessness and long-term homelessness. So you don't want veterans to be aging into long-term homelessness while they're in transitional housing. And this really re-emphasizes the need to expedite permanent housing placements from transitional housing for those who do not have a clinical need and do not express a desire for clinical services. And you know, it really emphasizes the need to ensure that no veterans are unnecessarily homeless or included in transitional housing for long periods of time, regardless of disability status. It really um, you know, sort of puts the onus on uh, the community to really emphasize that the need for permanent housing um, and, and only uh, when the veteran chooses something else um, to be able to offer that. So that was a lot of information about the federal benchmarks. Again, I really uh, urge you to, to go to the USICH website to know more about those significant changes. Um, and we uh, will be happy to answer some questions about them now. Um, but there is a lot more information on, on USICH's website. So I'm going to stop there. And we have a number of questions. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, we get to some of them. So uh, if everyone, uh, if all the panelists are are available to answer some questions. I'm just going to go ahead and start. Is that OK? Sure. OK, great. Um, so I'm just going to go through a bunch of these. Um, for the low demand model, uh, 24 on-site staffing is required. Is this 24 hour a week staffing? I guess, Jeff, that's a question for you. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, here's, here's the issue with the 24 hour staffing. Um, the, the veterans who are going to be serviced in these particular programs have some pretty significant needs. And one of the things that is going to be uh, a challenge in ensuring that uh, folks are safe is that um, you're going to have veterans who may return intoxicated. And you need to have a staffing plan that's going to be responsible to uh, be able to respond to that circumstance, like somebody coming back in the, the middle of the night uh, intoxicated and ensuring that they're safe. I think the likelihood is that they're going to need to be you know, pretty, uh, pretty available. Uh, it doesn't specifically say they must be awake. I think the chances are that they're going to be, uh, <laughs> considering, considering what they're being asked to do. Um, and I, and I think the other thing to consider uh, with the application uh, when you're developing these is that you're not you're not you're you're developing them on a couple levels. One, you're developing them in relationship to what your community needs, but you're also developing them um, in a competitive way. And so, uh, as the reviewers are looking at them and they're scoring at scoring them, they're going to be you know wondering how confident they are that your, you know, your project plan is a workable and the best plan possible. So I think, you need, I think you need to be careful that when you develop this kind of plan that you show that you can be responsive to an emergent need with somebody you know, coming back in crisis. So the, the key is that to have the, the staff on board, I think it's more likely that they're going to be Awake, it doesn't specifically say that, but I think it's more likely that they will be awake. I think your, your chances of, of uh, having a, a, better, um, a better grant uh, is just more likely. Thanks, Jeff. I think a lot of these questions are going to be for you, but please feel free to jump in, Bailey or Catherine, if you have any answers. Um, so for admission criteria for bridge housing, uh, does a veteran need to be enrolled in a permanent housing intervention prior to enrolling into bridge housing? Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. So the, the idea is not to, um, uh, uh, to bring uh, uh, someone in and then, let's say, two months later, do that now. Here, here is here's the one here's the one difference that that we do have a caveat in there that that talks about a 14 day period, um, and part of that has to do with we understand there's like this administrative process that happens to get people 
into programs. And so we have like this two-week window from the day that someone is admitted that that acceptance has actually occurred. And that's to allow the administrative process to catch up. So the idea, I mean, ultimately, you, you, want, you wouldn't want somebody, you know, freezing out on the street because, you, you, you know, the, the case manager wasn't available to finish signing off on the paperwork. Um, so the intent is, the spirit of this is, yes, they should have this offer before they come in, but we recognize that we have this 14-day window, and it's really pretty much an administrative window to get that acceptance documented. Does that make, I hope that makes sense for folks. Thank you. Uh, do you expect that many agencies and COCs will feel the service-intensive traditional housing model works best for the community and not pick one of the four priority models? And if so, you know, sort of how does that impact uh, the community? Uh, I, I don't know what folks are going to do, <laughs> to be real honest. Well, let me say this. I, 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 the initial, just if, if I go based on questions, uh, the volume of questions that we have, uh, I think the volume of the questions that we have suggests that there are going to be a lot of uh, applications for the first four models. And, I mean, the reason for that is obvious. I mean, we, we prioritize the first four models. Uh, and uh, so part of it, the strategy for folks is to um, to go where things are going to be prioritized. And in some cases, you know, uh, some folks have been doing some of this work for a while anyway. So I think the preponderance of, 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 of uh, services are going to be focused on uh, the, other, um, the other four models. I, I do think um, that there will be uh, service-intensive transitional housing. I think that will vary upon community. I mean, we still have communities that are kind of small where um, uh, some of these GPD programs are kind of all-purpose uh, kind of programs that, uh, you know, kind of sitting on the border of a couple of, couple of counties uh, to, to help veterans. I, I think that will, will vary a little. And then there are some uh, circumstances that are a little unique where they, things don't fall under one of the specific models. Um, a quick example, we had um, an organization who's thinking about um, doing some hospital housing, uh, which uh, what they describe totally makes sense. But they also, um, they also do some similar things uh, with uh, the community and um, veterans who are not involved in VA, are not eligible for VA health care. And there's not a way to put that in the hospital housing model because of the way the model is established. Um, and so a portion of that will end up being a service intensive transitional housing. So I think the, the, uh, the big answer is we don't know exactly how much, but I would think that there's going to be a lot that's going to fall into the, uh, the other four models. Thanks, Jeff. Um, another question here. Uh, what happens if a CUC doesn't provide a letter of support uh, or doesn't feel that the level of coordination is enough to provide a letter of support? Uh, well, there's a, there's a section that talks about um, coordination, and um, uh, it would be scored accordingly. Um, well, there's, 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 there's a, a couple of different things that, that um, speak to kind of coordinating kind of thing. There's a section that's called coordination. And uh, you know, certainly that would impact that particular score in that particular area. There's another section that talks about need. Um, and I mean, there's a specific question that, that looks at um, you know, how the outreach um, planning uh, is associated with, um, uh, let's say, a coordinated entry system, depending on what your, your system looks like. We recognize that communities are at different levels of development with this. Um, so it's, it's going to have a, it's going to have a a negative impact on the person's, uh, on the organization's application, and they, it would be scored accordingly. If our GPD program says that they do not have funding for 24-hour staffing, can they request more funding than they have received previously? Uh, it depends on what their, um, their maximum uh, per diem rate is currently. Uh, the per diem rate that, um, 
uh, we have just increased at the beginning of, of this year. Uh, and I don't know whether or not they've requested that. If they're not at the maximum per diem rate, uh, they could uh, re request that as an increase going forward. The other thing that they could always do, I mean, they could look at other sources of funding as well. Uh, that may be uh, an opportunity. Um, and, you know, some things may be beyond organizations' reach. These are all the types of things they have to think about going forward uh, with, this, with this particular model. Our, our per diem rate is, is uh, limited uh, by statute. And so, you know, it only goes up so much um, per year. But that is one of the, one of the questions for, for discussion. If you're talking with an organization, they're saying, well, we don't have enough for 24-hour um, staffing. The first question I always ask is, you know, what's your current per diem rate? And you would be surprised how many organizations are not at the maximum per diem rate. Um, many are. Most are or near the top. But there are many that are not, and so that would be an opportunity to uh, see if they uh, could uh, justify that particular expense for for uh, additional per diem um, in FY18. Thank you. Um, will all programs funded under this NEFA be required to report into HMIS? So uh, it's not specific that they're required to to report into HMIS, um, although. It's going to be hard for them to get uh, funded if they're not showing that integration. Um, we've had some challenges in, in, in trying to specifically in, in enforce that for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into right now. But, but many programs are. Uh, and when organizations are looking for ways to um, uh, uh, gain uh, support, uh, this is one of the areas of conversation that you need to have. Is uh, well, here's one of the things I'd like to see changed uh, as far as your participation and demonstrating immigration into the community, uh, participation in HMIS, uh, contributing to you know to uh, case conference things with the by name list. I mean, you could just name you know multitude of things. Um, and on the flip side of it, you should be also asking from the grantee applicant what they need as well. I mean, it's kind of a two-way street because they're, they're going to need some things to help make their application successful so that um, concerns that we all may have about, you know, someone coming into one of these programs and progressing as quickly as possible because we're making sure that we bring all the resources that are available to bear within the community to achieve a specific goal. Uh, and that, uh, just a, this is a clarification, uh, clarification question, if uh, someone is not currently a GPD program or VA Medical Center, they cannot apply for this NOFA, can they apply for this NOFA? Under this, under this notice of funding availability, they cannot apply. Um, the, this, was a, this was a big kind of uh, major portion of our transformation for the program, and so uh, this of uh, trying to, to move um, uh, the existing 20 some odd years of program uh, to time limited awards required a variety of um, uh, moves that we needed to make. And to do that, kind of the first phase with this was to get everyone who um, is currently existing or who would be operational after this award on a time limited award, and and you know deal with uh, some of the uh, other issues associated with folks who were not funded um, uh, through this through this particular process under one notice. Once we're able to clean that up, then you know going forward, you know we can look at other uh, opportunities in the future as as funding is available. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, many GPD programs have facilities, and um, the question is, asked, I think this person's asking, you know, how uh, communities should consider how the five models fit with their current building inventories, and how, you know, they should be, what, what kind of considerations they should make, be making, um, and how that, that kind of plays out. Wow, that is a fabulous question. I wish I had about 20 minutes for that one. Yeah, I thought that um, wasn't so, fair to give you too many Yeah, answer. yeah. No, no. I, I think, well, I, I, think, I think the question you're asking is a question actually you go back with. And you, you start looking at um, 
you know, obviously you're kind of d defining kind of what the need is, you know, in your community. And you're kind of looking at the at the resources. Um, you know, uh, part of it um, uh, part of it is not just the building. So, for example, uh, if you're thinking about hospital housing. Um, it, it, it might not only be kind of the, the building as far as accessibility and these kinds of things, but it might be proximity to the VA and the medical care that's going to be provided and associated with that. So you start thinking about these specific models and kind of you know where they would work. Uh, if you listen to, for example, on a presentation about um, uh, low demand, uh, it talks about you know uh, dealing with different populations uh, in a similar building. And being able to look at things like you know having separate wings for programs. If, let's say you had a, a low demand program in the same building that you had a clinical treatment program. Well, you might want to think about you know how you're going to have some physical layer a level of separation um, with a low demand program. You're going to want the staff offices a little bit closer to where the veterans are. You want to look at you know good practices that are like discussed on the presentation. Like do you have available a quiet room to kind of you know bring somebody to de-escalate someone if they come back intoxicated or if they're just kind of worked up. So all of these types of things you kind of have to think about as you're considering the need and then what kind of resources that you have within the program. Um, the, other, the other thing to, to think about as well is, you know, who else is going to be uh, collaborating because, um, you know, not only is the agency considering what, you know, what they're doing, but you know, um, they may be partnering with uh, other organizations that they may be bringing to decide to bring in the building to help leverage resources to to, to help veterans uh, meet specific goals. So all of those kind of things kind of play into the conversation as well. But that's a really wonderful question. I'm glad you're thinking about it. A really great question. Oh, thanks so much, Chef. I have. A, I, I want to let everyone go. So we have about a minute, but um, I wanted to just uh, give you the opportunity to, to just let people know. There's a lot of questions about how the low demand approach should work with people who are using substances and time limits, and how people should project time limits for different models. Is there somewhere? Are there resources that they can go to on the VA website? So there's a, there's a couple of different things um, that they can do. Um, um, other other than the, the uh, other than the presentations themselves, there are some frequently asked questions that are there. Uh, we're also uh, have been fielding uh, questions for applicants. So if if you're having conversations with uh, your your applicants uh, and uh, they have specific program driven or NOFA driven kind of questions, we do have a special email box for them and encourage them to 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 use that to submit us questions. And it goes to about four of us in the office, so we can it, it kind of rise to the top, and we, we know they're about the NOFA. So we we would encourage you to talk with them about that. I don't want to give it out to the entire world. We'll get we'll get inundated questions for folks who aren't necessarily involved with the NOFA, but in, encourage them to use that. If they don't know what that is, have them contact our office because um, we can, we can uh, you know make sure that they have that information as well. So those I, I, those are a few things that I think you you could do um, on the. Um, I, and I, we also had for low demand. Uh, you remind me of something. There was a there's a link uh, from not just uh, from the presentation, but to uh, a web page that the National Center sent up that um, that speaks to some information about low demand as well. So there's like a variety of things that are that are there. So well, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and I want to thank all the panelists for um, your time and, and presenting these uh, such great information. And especially Jeff Quarles, we really, really appreciate your answering so many questions. Um, thank you to everyone who's on the webinar. We will post these slides uh, and the webinar shortly um, on endhomelessness.org. Um, and there's a number of questions that were asked also. We will try to get those over to Jeff and get those answered. Um, thanks very much. And uh, we hope you have a great afternoon.